pop-up show with the art of the big sell. I feel like I just want to give you like maximum value. And so what we talk about on the big sell, and everybody knows about it, is that I bring on people, people that are changing the world, people that know how to make things happen, people that know how to build a movement. And so this guest of mine is not any different. This guest of mine, Kyle Brost, he is the founder of the, of the Spark Policy Institute. And he's so interesting in the things he's got going on. And he's kind of a young guy too. And I'm anxious to, talk, to jump into it. So Kyle, are you out there with us? I am. I'm right here. Okay, great. Well, I want you to tell us about the Spark Policy Institute. I was reading your website, which is uh, kylebrost, B-R-O-S-T dot com, which we will post. And um, you're very interesting. It looks like you sold your company at 28 years old and spun off several companies after that. So let's, let's hear a little bit about you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so actually, I sold my second company when I was 28. My first company I sold uh, when I was a little younger. Um, and then after I sold my second company, I started doing some consulting for large corporations, Fortune 500 companies in strategy and something called organization design. So just how you're, you're set up in terms of org chart and process flows and those kind of things. And so after doing that a couple of years with a boutique firm, I launched Choice Strategy Group, which is a corporate strategy firm. And then uh, last year, I started, uh, I acquired actually Spark Policy Institute. And so my work is all around strategy, strategic thinking for leaders, uh, how to formulate a strategy for your organization and then go out and execute that. And Spark Policy Institute actually does research and evaluation for the, the social and public sectors. So researching solutions to really, really big social problems like poverty and healthcare access and education. Um, and so we work with a lot of foundations and organizations to try to find the best solutions to the biggest problems. Wow, that sounds so interesting. So give us an example. So obviously you said you sold your second company, uh, or you, let's see, you sold your, you know, at 28 or 24, you had, you had had your second company. So what, what sets you down this path? I mean, strategic. So, you know, for example, I'm a sales strategist. That's what companies bring me in to do is to their sales teams are stuck and it's my job to push them through. So mm -hmm. tell me, you know, what, you know, if, if we were to hire you, if, if our companies were to bring you in and we were Dell or Google or, you know, one of the fortune five, what is it, what kind of problem would you solve exactly? I want to get a little more clear on that. Yeah, so if it's, a, if it's a company like Dell or Google or somebody like that, it would probably be a market-based solution. So we would explore how they're going to market with products. A lot of times when it's a really large company like that, they have some new product or new market they're trying to get into. Um, so a segment of the population that maybe isn't really bought into their products or using it. And so we would help them explore, how do you get to that market? What's the kind of product, the kind of service? How do you align the resources within your organization to actually get buy-in and engagement from potential customers? And how do you do it in a very socially responsible way? So we believe that being socially responsible produces the best outcomes um, in terms of impact, positive impact, as well as profitability. And so all of our efforts focus on how do we create impact and profitability? And so we would research, we would explore, we would come up with solutions and options, and we would facilitate that process for the organization to identify how do I take this product or this service into this market in a way that has a positive impact and produces profitability. Uh, and so we are the experts. We go collect the data. We figure out what data needs to be collected. We analyze that. We synthesize it. We compile it and put it into really executable ideas and concepts. And then we help the organization figure out from their very individual standpoint, how do we now execute or deliver on this idea or concept? So I love what you said about social impact because my new book, The Art of the Big Sell, you know, what we talk about really, especially with millennial buyers, and they're going to be so important, they are already, but in many, many segments of the economy. And what we know from our research is, to your point, and you're on to something, is the fact that the, especially this, this millennial consumer, you know, they want, they want double bang for their buck. Not only do they want a fantastic uh, purpose-driven product and company, but, you know, they want to know that it's almost double duty with their money, that, that their money, their, that their uh, participation with the company creates big social impact. So it sounds like that's what your company does. You help companies come up with what that social plan would be. Yeah, absolutely. So we do a lot of work um, in corporate social responsibility, which is 
kind of reverse engineering how you're going to have a social impact once you already have a really established business. But we also do a lot of work on the front end that says, if I'm just getting out there, how can I do this in a really responsible and effective way? And to your point, yeah, it's becoming more and more important to more and more consumers that the organizations they work with and that the, the products and services that they buy are not just high quality products and services, but that they are built and manufactured and distributed and created in a way that actually has a positive impact versus you know, some negative impact on society or the environment or all these other areas that run that risk. So when do you think that that, that mind shift, that paradigm shift started with the consumers? I'm a little bit older than you are. And so it's not always been about do what's good, do what's great. It's about, you know, Americans are such consumers and we want what we want when we want it. But there's definitely been a mind shift. When do you think that started and why? Well, so I think it's, I think it's been happening for a long time. Um, so, you know, you can go clear back to the 50s and see evidence of this kind of shift with books like The Jungle that talk about how they, you know, we can't just be profit driven. And, and that's a really extreme example of, look, you can't just, you know, you can't harm people in terms of creating profitability. But I think that's kind of the impetus, the start of it, that very initial st statement that says, look, we're not going to hurt people when we make profit. And then it has kind of evolved over time to say, well, that's not good enough. And now over the last probably 15 to 20 years has been this really big spike where I think the big shift has been in investors of organizations. So you have what's called the activist investor. You have an investor in uh, an organization who's not just taking their dividend and being happy with the shares that they have, but they're actually speaking up and saying, no, if I'm going to own part of this company, I want a voice and I want to be able to talk about what's happening. And so you've seen these massive collapses, you know, like Enron and stuff. And I think that all of that is culminating to people saying, well, let's get on top of this much earlier versus watching these really bad things happen. And then it, it kind of, you start with this, let's avoid really bad things. And it morphs into this, well, there's probably a better way rather than just avoiding bad things. Let's actually produce good things as part of this effort. So I think it's been happening for a really long time, but I think we've seen this big spike over the last 15 to 20 years where people have gotten much more engaged in it. And I think it correlates with technology, having much more access to people and to organizations and getting a voice out there, having bigger audiences for the average consumer. So it's hard to have you know, sway and, and power when your audience is just your neighborhood or your close friends. But now with social media and technology, anybody can have a really big audience and that forces organizations and corporations to be more mindful of how they approach things. So if you had to name the top five companies just off the top of your head that you think not only produce an excellent product, but tr have really truly have great social impact, who would those five companies be? Uh, well, the first one that comes to mind is probably one that not a lot of people have heard of, but it's a company called Holman, um, and they're out of, uh, I think, Denmark. But they do, uh, they manufacture wood products, so like cardboard boxes and paper products, and, and that tends to be from an environmental standpoint, which I'm not necessarily an environmentalist, but from an environmental standpoint, wood products are an easy target, right? Because you're chopping down forests and, and you know, uh, destroying habitat and those kind of things. But Holman does all of that. But they took a different approach. Rather than buying trees and then leaving the land and ha letting somebody else worry about it, Holman about 25 years ago started actually buying their own land. And so they only harvest trees from land that they own and they have a, a policy in place that says they will replenish more every year than they actually harvest which is a really smart business decision yeah. because you've created a sustainable product now. Uh, literally, your product will sustain and you'll always have something to harvest if you're always planting more. Um, and it has to drive the cost down because they're not having to pay other people to harvest their trees. And so yeah. I, th I would think just from a profitability standpoint, that's a smart move. And well, and that's the point, right, is we really work with organizations to find what is the smart move for your organization. Um, so that's a really good example. I think Unilever has some stuff out there that is pretty fascinating that they're doing in terms of um, using market-based solutions to help poverty. Uh, so they're, you know, trying to provide jobs. They're, uh, you talk about women. Um, one of their efforts in, in Africa has been to provide employment to women so they can actually distribute Unilever products. Uh, like soaps and things and get commission for distributing and selling those. And so I think Unilever is probably up there. 
uh, surprisingly, there's you know some really cool foundations that are doing a lot of great work, like Walton Family Foundation, which people might not assume. Uh, you know, Walton family associated with Walmart might not assume they're doing really amazing things, but they're doing some really cool stuff in terms of fisheries and making sure that not only do the economies where people are, you know, harvesting fish uh, benefit from that harvest, but that they're creating a sustainable way of doing it. There's actually, I mean, when you get into it, there are a lot of really, really amazing things happening um, in the corporate space as well as the foundation space in terms of doing it the right way. So what does your company do? So tell me, you know, obviously if this is what you do and it's what you sell. What is your passion? What is the one thing, the legacy that you want to leave and your company wants to leave behind and on this earth and, and be known for above and beyond, you know, just what you do? So our big piece is that we don't just go out and research the problems. We want to give people tools to do it themselves. So we are really focused on what we call capacity building on the corporate sector. It's called capability building. But our focus is really not on, you know, tooting our own horn and saying, hey, we can find solutions to really big, complex problems, but actually taking it a step further and saying, we'll actually give you the tools and the skills and the capability and capacity to solve those problems on your own. So our legacy would be not that we solved some great big problem, but that we gave other people tools to solve problems that will surface in the future. Because you're never going to solve every problem and live in utopia. Right. Uh, there's always going to be new things. And so giving those tools and capability to other people is really big. And that's for me personally. I mean, I do a lot of executive coaching and it's all around strategic thinking and giving people tools on how to make strategic, wise decisions in some of the most challenging and dynamic circumstances. And so well, I, it also gives you, your company and other companies, you know, the ability to scale, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if everybody was waiting on somebody else to do it, then I don't think things happen as quickly. So when you, you know, when you teach somebody how to solve their own problem, you know, I would think that their their in their income and their, their company can expand and scale so much faster than counting on somebody else or outsourcing that. So I think that's brilliant. And so Kyle, going to your to your website, you know, one of your your quotes is I turn individuals and leaders into strategists and change makers. How did yeah. you come up with that? That's um well, the strategy piece kind of surfaced organically uh, when I was working as a strategy consultant, uh, which I still do a decent amount, but I also run companies, so I don't get to do that as much as I used to. But when I was working actively as a strategy consultant, um, I used to have a lot of leaders. We would come out of sessions and they would ask, they would say, how did you, you know, how did you know to ask that question? Or how did you come up with that idea? And so I, I started to just share one, it forced me to actually be really introspective because a lot of times I didn't know off the cuff, you know, like how I came up with it, but it forced me to think about it. And so over time that developed into executive coaching on how to actually teach leaders to be, to be strategic thinking, to be uh, strategists. And so that one just developed through work. The, the change maker piece came a little later. So I would say, you know, in my, early to mid 20s, I wasn't that worried about social impact or environmental impact or any of those things. I was worried about making money, frankly. Um, and so over time, though, I found that uh, that my rate of, of income was trending at a different level than my rate of satisfaction. So my income was going like this, but my satisfaction was you know, going like this. And so I realized there's not a real strong correlation between how much money I'm making and how satisfied I really am. And that's where the change maker came in is it, it was the passion that really pulled it all together that helped me see that strategic thinking can be applied in so many spaces. And when you give people the ability to think strategically and to solve really important problems, there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction that comes from that. And so that's where uh, the change maker piece came in because I don't just want to help people be strategists for the sake of thinking strategically and then go out and do something that's kind of pointless. I want people to think strategically so that they can solve really big business problems, really big social problems. So, so take me through that a bit. So, you know, let's say that I was the VP of sales for a company and, mm -hmm. and we, we brought you in. How do you teach people? Because I have found over the years, you know, I consider myself a strategist, yeah. a high level strategist. And, but I have found over the years, it's hard to teach people sometimes how to do that. 
you know, give us just a couple of your tips. You know, how do you teach somebody who really isn't operating or a company that, that is not operating from, from a, a, a strong strategic standpoint? You know, they're either operating uh, in fear, in, in emotion, in whatever it may be, but they're not operating at their full potential because they're not, they're not fully, uh, you know, their, their whole business plan, it has, you know, does, does not have a strong strategic plan behind it. So what are some of the things that you and your team come in and do, Kyle? Well, so I, the first thing we do is we put a very strict structure in place. And it's not because that structure has to always be in place. But when you talk about the ability to actually get people to think strategically and change their behavior, putting a really strict structure in place is what enables that to happen on the front end. And once that structure is in place and people are following some really strict processes for how you solve problems, then they can modify and adapt that later on. But too often we just try to go in, we give really generic uh, advice and we think that somehow that's gonna change somebody's behavior. We found that putting a process in place, an actual articulated process that, that says, when you face this problem and you don't know the answer, here's the steps you follow. We found that putting that process in place is what enables us to adapt later on. So once they learn the process, then we can talk about, okay, now that you're following this process, here's how you can adapt and adjust and make it more your own. But we always start with that foundational process. So I think that's the first piece is giving people a process to follow that they can later on adapt and adjust from versus it being really nebulous and kind of arbitrary. And then people wonder why, why aren't I making progress? Why aren't I learning how to do this? Um, but in terms of a couple of quick pointers that, that we give people, I think the first one is, and I, I tell people this a lot, but it's just always stay focused on your long-term intentions because that's what, when you get into an uncertain or an emotional situation, the first thing to go are long-term intentions. So I'm now emotional and guess what? Now I'm driven to these really short-term immediate needs yep. that 30 minutes later, I'm not gonna care anything about. You know, it's that fight or flight response. And so the first tip we give it to people is look, you have to be really clear about what your long-term intentions are so that you can stay focused on them. Um, and that's the other, the other point that we give people around uncertainty is you're always going to run into really uncertain situations where you don't have all the answers. You don't really understand everything that's going on. And even in the midst of uncertainty, if you're clear about your long-term intentions, you can bring that level of certainty to the situation. So it doesn't matter what's going on out here. If I know what I'm focused on and what I want to achieve, I can always bring that into the situation. And that brings a certain level of certainty. So the, the first point that we always give people is get really clear about your long-term intentions. What are your long-term goals so that you can bring those into every situation and constantly remind yourself of what those are. Uh, and it's a, one of my favorite quotes that used to be on this gym wall that I worked at was discipline is remembering what you want. And, mm. and sometimes, you know, when it's really emotional, it's hard to remember what it is you really want. You get caught up in proving somebody else right or, sorry, proving somebody else wrong or protecting your pride or getting defensive. Yes. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, you're saying, gosh, I'm an idiot. Why did I say that? You know, I just destroyed a relationship or I just put another barrier to me achieving my long-term goal all because I got distracted by something really short-term and emotional. So does, does that go along the line of emotional intelligence and, and working through that, you know, like, you know, never, ever make a decision, you know, high emotion, low intelligence, you know, yeah. that whole thing? Yeah, it does very much. You know, we actually take, and we speak a lot to emotional intelligence because one of the things about strategy is everybody's a good strategist when things are going smoothly, right? right. Everybody looks brilliant and good when the market's great and, or, you know, the business is succeeding. It's when things really get crappy that you find out if somebody's a strategist or not. And so we speak a lot to emotional intelligence because where strategy fails is when things are really emotional and uncertain. And uh, everything comes off the rails then. Yeah, absolutely. And we actually take it a step further and we talk about not just, you know, I think a lot of people think of emo emotional intelligence as how do, I, how do I manage or control my emotions? How do I kind of shut them down? And, and, you know, I think that's one of the worst things people can do because emotion has a purpose and it gives us energy. I mean, you think about, and I don't just mean in like some kind of 
foo-foo thing. I just mean literally when you're emotional, your adrenaline starts going, you, your blood starts pumping, and you're amped up. And I think that we talk a lot about how do you leverage that versus how do I just shut it down, turn it off? Because right. emotion is what really mobilizes people to do really great things. And if you're just constantly shutting it down, turning it off, then you're, it's going to be a lot harder for you to be mobilized. So we, we talk a lot about how do you actually leverage your emotions versus yes. just turning them down or ignoring them or controlling them. And, you know, same thing with fear. You know, I talk about that. You know, fear is real. Excuse me, yeah. danger is real, but fear is a choice. Mm. So, you know, 95% of what we fear never materializes, but we spend so yeah. much time on it in here and up here. Um, and you have to learn how to repurpose it. You know, it, it's there, it's real, but you've got to learn how to repurpose it, stick it on the shelf and move through. And I think it's the same yeah. when it comes to high emotion and it comes to making decisions during high emotion times in your life, you know, whether it's your business is failing or your relationship is failing, whatever it may be. So I agree with you in the fact that I don't think that you should push down your emotion because I feel like that, that, that charges you, but I think you've got to learn how to, uh, you know, channel that emotion yep. and then also learn to sometimes walk away for a little while and just let it settle down and then come back to the table. I know that I've had to do that in some big negotiating things I've done over the years. It's just when it's, it tends to get pretty boiled, it's just better for everyone to set the pen down at the, at the table, walk away yeah. for a little while and, and come back again, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that down. is, yeah, that is one of the most powerful tools that I think get ignored so often. It, there's a, a, an incredible amount of power in simply walking away from a situation. Oh, I yes. mean, you think of and even in a really intense negotiation, the amount of power you have when you set your pen down and you stand up and say, I'm going to walk away for a few minutes yep. and watch four days how yep. in my case, <laughs> yeah, four days. Yep. And watch how everybody else reacts at the table because you've just taken control of that situation and there's nothing anybody can do at that moment. You're the one that's fully in control. And so yeah. we talk a lot about that. There are very few decisions that have to be made in that moment. Most of them can wait to your point, you know, five minutes or a few days even, or, yeah. you know, much longer. And so that's one of the pieces of advice we give a lot of people is, man, exert your power by simply walking away it's from Walking it. away because yeah. you have totally at that point, I don't care who's winning, you have shifted the power, you've changed yeah. the conversation and it's now gone onto your terms because it's when you return. And that's yeah. one of the things I teach, you know, in negotiation, the first one who speaks loses. And when it gets highly charged, set it down, walk away, because you have now taken, I, I, don't, I don't care if you're at the bottom of the conversation, you've now taken control because they can't move forward without yep. you. Yep. And yes. they know it. I mean, you watch their faces and they know it. And, and the other thing is you come back with even more power because you've been able to process. Think about it. Better. Yep. And yep. so that, that is all, you know, that is one of the best recommendations we give to people is when it's highly emotional and it's uncertain and, and, and negotiations are emotional. You know, one of mine yeah. was selling yeah. a company, you yeah. know, so, you know, so not only, you know, it's, it's, it's personal, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, so, so many times, you know, people don't realize too, that, that so much of what we do, especially at our level, at high level entrepreneur, um, because, because why we do what we do is because we're passionate and we're smart people and all of that, but you know, it gets personal sometimes. Yeah. And so I, I learned that a lot of years ago too. The minute it gets personal, set it down, walk away, bolt your head back on. And then, and then come back to it. And yeah. uh, not only have you taken control of the, of the conversation, of the situation, but then the other party starts thinking, oh boy, what is she going to come back with now? Right. You know? Yep. And so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're on the same page. So as we wrap Absolutely. things up, tell people, you know, how, how can they get a hold of you? You know, you know, do you have a book or a course or something coming out that... I do, actually. Great I got, yeah, I do. So uh, there's one that will be released, and it's actually all free. It will be on my website called Escalate. Um, it should be up in the next uh, two to three weeks at the most. Um, and it's I'll all about- I'll actually post that just so you know, so everybody oh, can find that. Perfect. Um, and so it's all about getting unstuck and building momentum. And so the, the kind of core principle to escalate is that most people approach a problem at the high level and they find that they can't do that and they de-escalate. They say, well, I couldn't give this much effort, but maybe I can give this much effort. And when that doesn't work, they say, well, maybe I can give this much effort. And they're constantly weakening their ability to actually achieve the goal. And so we flip that on its head and we give you tools. I give you tools 
that say start at the easiest piece and constantly build into more powerful ways of doing it rather than de-escalating. You want to escalate your effort. I mean, if you're trying to achieve, if you're trying to go to the Olympics, you would never say, well, training an hour a day didn't work. Maybe I should train 15 minutes. <laughs> right. Escalate it, right? And you would say an hour didn't work. I'm going to have to do two or three hours, right? But in our own personal goals, for some reason, we constantly de-escalate and we give weaker and weaker effort. And so what you I need think it's because of two things, don't you? I think it's because we're two things. I think we're either operating in fear mm -hmm. or, you know, we, we, we had a setback of some sort. And so now we're discouraged and then we start doubting ourselves. Do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. And, and so the escalate process is a very, actually, I mentioned up front that I like to give strict processes up front that people can learn. And then once they know that process, modify and adapt later on. And so this is actually a strict process that if you're stuck in working toward a goal and you need to build momentum, this process will get you unstuck. And then you can modify and adapt from that process as you learn it. But that'll be uh, you know, free here in, in the next couple of weeks. And then I have the art of strategic reaction, which is really speaks to the emotional intelligence piece and how to think strategically in really uncertain and emotional situations. And that course uh, is a, a paid for course, and it'll be coming out here in about four to six weeks. Well, that sounds very exciting. So how Thanks. much time do you spend um, on coaching executives and, you know, working on the courses and things like that versus, you know, running your companies. Cause you sound like you're a really busy guy. You've got three companies and you've got this other side business. And so what does that look like for you? Well, I mean, fortunately I have uh, really great teams in place. And so I'm not doing this on my, there's no way I could do it on my own. Um, and so Spark Policy Institute, Choice Strategy Group, they have employees and directors and people who really help manage those businesses. So the, the investment from me, time investment from me is uh, a lot smaller. So I, I dedicate quite a bit of my time to the, the strategic thinking, executive coaching in these courses, probably 40% of my time right now. Um, and then the other 60% is on my businesses that, uh, that, you know, staff and employees and clients need me. So, uh, yeah, well, it sounds like you have a, a passion, not only for business, but, and, but for people itself. And it looks to me like you have truly built a movement of your own, um, well, thank you. you know, within your organizations and just, you know, what your strategy is. And I think that's great. So how, will, how can people find you? Uh, we are going to post your website, um, are you uh, is social media or, you know, what, what's the best way to connect with you if they're looking to hire you or your company for your services? Yeah. So I th my personal website's a great place. Um, my biggest following is on Instagram. So if you just want to stay in touch and kind of see what's happening from day to day, it's just at Kyle Brost, uh, for Instagram. And then I have a Facebook page, which is Kyle Brost, the Facebook page. Um, and so those are b both great places. I, I try to stay pretty connected to people. So if you shoot me messages there, I will try to respond, um, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. And then on my website's my email address. I'm, I'm pretty accessible. So you shouldn't feel like there's uh, it's hard to get in touch with me. That's for sure. Well, Kyle, I thoroughly appreciate uh, our conversation today and just, you know, you know, I love to talk to like-minded people. I love to talk to people that are on the same page. And really at the end of the day, I think people like you and me, you know, not only are we out to, I mean, we're out to make the world a better place. And I think that that gives us just as much fulfillment as the paycheck does. Absolutely. Thanks so much. I well, enjoyed thank it. you. Okay. And uh, everybody, I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning into my podcast, The Art of the Big Sell. And I'm going to have all of Kyle's information uh, posted on both Facebook and on the website so that you can find out how to connect with Kyle and uh, get that free course. That sounds amazing to me. All right, everybody. Thanks so much.